so let's uh, get there's a lot of technology involved in this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there are so many moving parts involved with this. It is insane what we've got going on. I'm looking at, I've got two screens down here. I've got a camera up there. I've got an earpiece in my ear and talking to Swapnil down there. And I'm looking up at you, but he's down here. And it is, I'm having to fight all of my instincts not to look down at Swapnil. <laughs> just to talk to him. Don't so, look down at me. You no, should be looking up at him. <laughs> I know. I'll put the I'll put the I'll put the screen up here so I'm looking up at Swapnel. <laughs> I didn't yeah. mean that metaphorically. I meant that literally. No, since you're a, since you're a fiction writer, so I have to be careful what you say because your words do carry a lot of weight. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. Before uh, I mean, you are better at intros and stuff like that because you are an artist. You know, I'm yeah. just so. Uh, let, let's, you know, before we get into this, what we are trying to do, uh, can you talk a bit about, you know, when and how you started your open source journey? Sure. Why it matters to you? Sure. And, uh, yeah. Um, I was teaching back in 19, I think it was 95. I was an adjunct faculty member at the University of Indianapolis where I was teaching in the theater department. I have a bachelor's of science and, a, and an MFA in acting. So my background is actually from the world of theater. And I, I had a 20 year uh, career as an actor, but uh, while I was teaching back then, I, it was the first time I, had, I actually had to buy a computer. I had to have one for my classes to do all of the things I needed to do as a teacher. And it's funny when I look back and I paid like uh, $3,000 for this Pentium 75 computer. And it came with Windows 95. Um, I think it was Windows 95. It may, have, yeah, it was Windows 95. So I, I, I was so excited about this because I'd never used a computer before, and it was uh, um, well, I had briefly used one, but that was back in uh, undergraduate school when we had this Mac Macintosh farm, but that was using OS 9, where I, I was charged with creating all of the. Uh, playbills for the theater department. So I was doing graphic design on those. And interesting little sidebar, way back then, um, somehow I managed to crash the entire Mac farm at school. Uh, the, I had used a disc that was corrupt for some reason, and I put it in, and then all the Macs went down. I, don't, I can't explain that. It could have been just coincidence, but that's my story. So I'm teaching this class, and I'm working on Mac, uh, Windows 95 with this Pentium 75, and it kept blue screening on me. It kept crashing and I was losing, I was, just left and right, I was losing data. And it was getting really frustrating. So during that process, I, you know, I struggled through because I didn't really have the time to dedicate to learning something different. So I struggled through it. But during that next year, uh, I, I knew that I had to find something different because Windows 95 was just killing me. Mm -hmm. So I started searching around, and this was back, you know, with bulletin boards and all of that, and I found mention of this thing, new thing called Linux. So I kept looking at it and reading about it and reading all the warnings that how challenging it was, and it was new. And eventually, I finally went to uh, CompUSA. If you're old enough, you'll probably remember CompUSA. So I go to CompUSA and I'm looking around and I, I always went to CompUSA because I was always looking for new software or games and such because I was really into like cyberpunk games at the, at the time. And so I was going down the aisles and I went down the operating systems aisle. And of course it was just nothing but windows. But then down on the bottom row, there, was, there were three or four boxes. And one of them was Red Hat 4.2 and one of them was Caldera Open Linux 1. I like the name Caldera. So I bought Caldera Open Linux 1 and it was like 70 bucks at the time. And I went home and I, you know, it was first time I'd ever bought an operating system. I'd used a computer enough that I was familiar with how they work, but I'd never purchased an operating system. I felt like I was reaching a new level of geekdom. So I, fired the computer up, put the disks in, and I sat back and waited for the magic to happen. <laughs> Little did I know, uh, way back then, it was, you know, the, the whole installation was end curses and all that. 
So the first scream came up and I was like, oh no, what's going on? I was kind of afraid of it. And, but I realized that, you know, I, I, I had to do this. I, I, I had to just dive in feet first because that's the way I, I am by nature. I just dive in. So I clicked OK and installed it. And it was rough going at first, the installation, because I was so unfamiliar with it. But eventually I got it installed and I, and I booted it up. And the interface was somewhat, it was uh, FVWM95, so it was similar to Windows 95. Uh, and there, it, you click on the start menu and there's all this software, because you know back then, early on, Linux distributions just installed this massive amount of software. And a lot of scientific stuff and things that I knew that I wouldn't really need. And of course, the first thing I needed to do was get online. <laughs> and that was when the real struggle began. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I kept trying and trying and trying to get this computer to get online, something that was just happened when I used Windows. And I thought, oh no, what's happened? I can't get it to work. So I kept struggling and struggling and struggling. And eventually I, I gave up on Caldera Open Linux and I went back to CompUSA and I, I bought the bullet and bought Red Hat. I brought Red Hat home, installed it. I was kind of used to the end curses installation by now, so installing Linux was kind of a breeze, which was crazy at the time. But I installed Red Hat, and the the interface was a little more familiar, a little bit more, at the time I would say modern, but it looked better. But I still couldn't get it online. No matter what I did, I could not get this computer to get online, and I thought, whoa, what good is it? So I went to my roommate's computer and I did a little searching and I discovered to my dismay and chagrin that my computer had in it, and I'm sure anybody listening knows what I'm about to say, say it with me, a win modem. That's right. It was a win modem. It wouldn't work, period. So mm -hmm. this, all of the suggestions on this one particular bulletin board that I was going to said, go get a U.S. Robotics 36.6 external modem, and it'll work just fine out of the box. So once again, I go back to CompUSA. I purchase the US Robotics uh, external modem. I come home, I plug it in, I reboot the computer, and bam, I was online. And after that, there was no more needing Windows 95, and I could do my work. And at the time, I was using um, Star Office. So I had Star Office, I had Red Hat, and I didn't have these crashes anymore. So I could do my work and I wouldn't have to worry about losing my data. And I never had a problem. And what's really, what I find so interesting about this is that you hear all these people complain and moan how difficult Linux is, but I was new to computers. I had used Windows 95 for a brief amount of time and I installed Linux, and this is, you remember, this is early on. This was back in 96, 97, when Windows, when Linux was just starting. And if I, if you compare Linux now to Linux then, Linux now is ridiculously easy. Linux back then was pretty challenging. So I, I didn't have any problems at all. And I had nothing but problems with Windows. So it was like a, a switch was flipped for me. And it, it, it was like going from night to day and all of a sudden the clouds parted, the angels sang, and my computer actually worked for me instead of against me. And right. from that point on, I, I, and I, I didn't use, it, it took me years to have to actually go back and use Windows. And the only reason I had to go back and use Windows for something was for a job that I was doing. But personally, I didn't have to use Windows for any or Linux for or yeah Windows for anything anymore. And then all of a sudden, um, w another interesting little fact was um, during, back in those early days, um, I once I got the computer back online, I I found another bulletin board and I found this guy and I can still remember his name. His name was Mark Green, and I I, I started asking him all these questions and then he gave me his email address and then. He said, anytime you have a question, feel free to email me. Send me a question. Or, or, and then we got on I, uh, AIM and our, you know, the AOL Instant Messenger um, and then ICQ. And we just we would chat. And I, I was single at the time, 
So I was I was up until 3 a.m. chatting with him about Linux, and then he got me hooked on the After Step window manager, and between us, we got this thing configured where it was like complete window transparency, and it was just totally tricked out. And when people would come and see my desktop at home, they would freak out. They'd be like, how do you do that? I want to do that with my computer. It's like, well, it's Linux. It's not Windows. So there's a whole, you know, at that point, I had put months and months of time getting this desktop configured the way it was. So I guess early on, I'm, you know, I was... I was weaned on challenge with Linux. So mm -hmm. it it just became so easy eventually that now all, Linux has almost become boring. Right. But that's a good thing. Yeah, boring is good. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then um everything was kind of solidified was I took a break from acting. I took a, a short short hiatus and when I did that I was I was so enamored of computers at that point. I decided I'm going to go study something else. I want to go get a. I was going to get my bachelor's degree in information systems technology, and I went to a school here. And while I was, this is really this is not embarrassing, but uh, while I was there, um, I joined the Linux users group. So we met once a week in the basement of the engineering building, and mm -hmm. I. It was like one of the first few meetings, and I remember we were everybody was talking. And I said, "Yeah, I just got Diablo working on Wine," and everybody's like, "What?" And so I told them, I showed them how to get Diablo working on Wine, and then um, this guy came to one of the meetings, and he was from a new website that was being built. And he said, we're looking for writers. In particular, we're looking for writers to talk about Linux. And I was like, me, you want me. I'm the guy you want. You want me. And he said, okay, fine, let's, let's talk. And we had a quick meeting. And uh, I, had, I had never written anything technical before, but I had written other things. I had written stage plays. I had written um, short stories and things like that. So, and, and my grammar was fairly good, and I, I could write a story. So I, I sent him, I submitted something to him, and he said, okay, here's a topic. Write something, give me a topic, give me a, an article on Linux. So I wrote him an article on Linux, and next thing I know, he said, we're going to hire you as a contractor to write four articles a month on Linux. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then I, uh, I, I tried to continue on with the information systems technology degree, but then I got into an argument with the chairman of the department. <laughs> and the the... I went to the chairman of the department one day and I said, why are you not teaching Linux? And he looked at me with all seriousness and he said, because Windows has the market share. And I said, I looked at him and I said, you are trying to educate and graduate all of these students who are going to be dealing with networking technologies and they're not going to have any idea about the technology that powers the backbone of the systems. And you're okay with that. And he said, yeah. And I said, then I'm done. I walked out of his office and I left the school and I didn't look back. So at that point I was, I, and that, that website that came to that users group was Tech Republic. <laughs> and they wanted to start, they were actually starting, they were going to, at the time they were going to start a Linux Republic. And we started and they built it with me and I wrote all this content for it. And then, and then um, someone else kind of took over and they said, and again, they said, "Well, Windows has the market share, so blah blah blah." And they said, "We're gonna we're gonna scrap Linux Republic." And I was like, "You really don't want to do that. You really want to keep this going, because trust me, when I say that one day Linux is going to be so crucial to business, they will not know what to do without it. And if you keep this going, you will have something really special." Well, they didn't listen to me because I was just me. I was, you know, just a, I was a low man on the totem pole. And, uh, but I'm still with Tech Republic. I still write a ton of content for them. And uh, I still, Linux is still my primary operating system. I, I do use Mac OS for two things, really. <laughs> Video editing and when I get my books back from my editor, I have to use pages mm -hmm. because of what she uses. But uh, honestly, 
when I think about it, I don't know where I would be had it not been for me not discovering Linux. Mm-hmm. And for me, just if I if had I not discovered Linux, I would not be where I am today. Right. And I am very grateful for Linux and open. I mean, open source has made built and made my career pretty much. Yeah, I can see that on the t- uh, on the tattoos on your body. So. Yeah, yeah. I've got the Ling- Linux ping. I've got the old Red Hat logo, and I have the old Ubuntu logo there as well. Yeah. So now Red Hat is working on their new logo, so you will have. A I know. I know. I yeah. know. That's that's a very good. Uh, I think that's a very good journey in the in the in, you know your venture into the Linux world. Mine was a bit different. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is funny is that. Uh, uh, in the school days, because I grew up in India, school days, uh, I think when we were in the fifth or sixth grade, they were offering a uh, computer or Hindi language. And back in those days, you know, it was like computer, you go in the room, you do the whole basic flow chart, you go to and all those things. I don't even know which year was that. And we went there initially, uh, but after that I lost interest in it because um, I was more, I was a science fiction writer, so I was more into science kind of stuff where I can actually do things. So I had a chemical lab in my home where I'll do a lot of chemical experiments, I'll do a lot of electronics experience, experiments. So I did not see much that I can do beyond what they were telling. So you are telling me to do this and it does that and it's finished. So it, that's not something new or, you know, creative or exciting. So next year I chose Hindi language over computer. So I gave up on computer totally. And you won't believe that uh, I did not use computer at all till... Uh, 1990 that's when i uh internet came to the town through you know you used to go to cyber cafes and stuff like that and that's when i found that that's a very because i used to go to libraries to do research for my stories and you know the fiction that i was writing that was my bread and butter you know i used to make electronic devices for you know other people and that's how i used to make money back in those days Uh, and that's how i started writing because i created a circuit diagram and i uh, gave it to a publication it was called electronics for you no, not electronics for you. It was a Hindi magazine, and uh, and they published it, and that's how I was. I think 16 or 17 years old. That's when I started getting paid to <laughs> writing, and uh, and I kind of enjoyed kind of fame because I was also on All India Radio. Uh, I will go and you know recite my stories there. So when I will go to the local post office, uh, the postmaster when he sees me, he says, "Oh, you're Sopnil. Yeah, yeah." Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard your story on radio, like, come inside. So uh, every time I go, to, of course, back in those days, we had to post the stories. There was no email, you know, so I had to physically type the story. And, and I used to have a typewriter, you know. Uh, I will type the story and post, and he'll always invite me, come inside and give me a special treatment. Uh, uh, then I found the internet, so I would go to Cyber Cafe and use their... I would just sit whole day, you know. i will go in the morning and come back in the night. <laughs> <clears throat> I still did not have a computer. Uh, once I was writing a long uh, book, then I borrowed a computer from my friend, Vishal Said, and he lent me the computer. So he, he ran a school, so I will borrow his computer every weekend and use it and give it back to him. Because I never saw, I had a typewriter and I was more than happy with the typewriter. Then I, I moved to New Delhi and that's when I started uh, the filmmaking course and the journalism course. And that's uh, when uh, I met a filmmaker. He was also the head of the department of where I was getting my uh, filmmaking and journalism course. And he saw me that I was doing some, you know, video editing work. Okay, there's a long story behind that. Is when I was, when I finished my, uh, I don't know what they call here, but college there, which is 12th grade, uh, I had, you know, I come from a belt where they go into administrative services, uh, which I don't know what is the equivalent from here, but it's like federal government services which, you know, highly paid job, very reputable. My brother was into this, so there was a big pressure from my family to do the same thing. I did not want to do that. So I lied to them that I'm going to Delhi to pursue a course for that particular kind of um, job. I went to Delhi, I I stayed with my friend, uh, I explored uh, certain things, and I did not like, you know, all those, you know, those kind of jobs. Uh, that's when I found this in the university about filmmaking and journalism. I went there, took the test, and uh, then, you know, I, uh, I think that year it was for TV anchor or something like that. And, of course, I did not have a TV presence back then. I was very slim, you know. When you're in the student days, you know, you're very slim and everything. I don't think I still have any camera presence, but I... <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, I came back to Lakhimpurkiri, uh, my hometown, and I went back again for the next season. And this time I, uh, I contacted a lot of established writers because my sister was already an established writer in Hindi literature and she was doing her PhD. So I was following a lot of writers who were based in Delhi. So I, uh, uh, I you know, kind of touched bases and one was Asghar Wajahat. You know, he's a very prominent writer in India. And I called him and he said, hey, Swapnilji, come tomorrow and we'll meet. So I went to the university. I met him and he said, hey, why don't you start as my assistant? You know, you start. I mean, I have so many things to do. You can assist me in translation from Hindi to English and we can go to meeting. We can do a lot of things. So you just I said, well, he's a, I mean, he I used to be his fan as a reader, you know, and he's a very prominent writer. Uh, why not? And it, that will kind of, you know, bring me to that field as well. So I started working with him. And then he was working on, uh, he was a head of department of this, you know, multimedia section of that university. Uh, so one of his friend, he had some very old folk music and he was trying to digitize them. So he asked, Swapnil, do you, can you do that? And I did not own a computer till then, you know, <laughs> I did not have a computer. Right. I said, yeah, sure. But my only good thing was I was very good into electronics. So I was very good into learning things. So I used this computer and I, you know, we got a tape recorder and stuff like that. And I started digitizing and then I started using Nuendo software used to be there for, for audio, you know, so I was trying, because it was old audio. So I was trying to recover the tracks. So, so the, the head of the department of film and journalism course, he saw me working on these files. So he, and I applied for that course and I was selected into that course. I joined that course. So he said, Hey, Swapnil, uh, I, I live just, you know, three minute walk from here you live so far you take a bus in the morning why don't you you know just move in with uh, me because like i have five house rooms there in my house and you can also help me with my filmmaking projects because i do a lot of documentary filmmaking so i moved in with him and i started doing the filmmaking thing with him and it was mac back then and that's how i learned uh, you know more film editing uh, through him and through my course then i finished the course then i started looking for the job I wanted to go to Mumbai to pursue filmmaking, but I knew that I was only 25, I guess, by that time. And I know it will be too much wastage of my time to go to Mumbai. So I said, let's just try to do something in Delhi. So I tried to find print job. My first job was uh, with a tourism magazine. I worked there for three months. I did not like it. It was just like you know, make up stories about how things are good. And there was no real uh, stuff there. That's when, you know, a job opening for Electronics Review magazine group came out. And that was the magazine that I used to read in the childhood days. That was my favorite magazine. So I applied. I met Rahul Chopra, who was editor. And, you know, I got, you know, kind of, you know, I got a job. And so they were starting a new property called EFI Times. And they needed somebody to kind of head it. So I kind of become as a senior correspondent. I started the site. Then they hired more journalists under me, new interns kind of thing. And there was a at one time, there was a team of nine journalists working. So we were like, you know, creating a news items for, because they had four or five public magazines, print magazines. So we are creating, you know, news for each group. But the site itself grew so much. It was meant to be an intranet, but it, was, it grew so well that it became internet. And it was amazing because in the early days, uh, Keyhole Company, which was acquired by Google, which is now known as Google Earth, the CTO of that company was in India. So he contacted me to meet him. I said, okay, I can meet. So that's how I started building context. The, the, the exposure to Linux, the way it happened was they were using a Fedora Core LTSP server on the terminals, not Windows machine. And I hated it and despised it. It was so crappy. And I will always complain about it because I was a Windows user. Uh, but uh, also the, the, the IT admin guy was, I mean, he was friendly, but he was not doing the Linux preaching thingy as much as you would expect or advocacy because he was already kind of tired for the whole day managing all the servers and systems. <laughs> That's when, uh, though he will come to my hole because he lived near where I live. So he would come and use my system and install putty on it to, to look at his servers and stuff. I don't know why he didn't want to log in from his system. Maybe because he didn't want his boss to know where he was. So because you have the logs, you know, you created the logs so your boss will know where the log, where you log in from. <laughs> anyway, then another guy joined in. Uh, they ha used to have a magazine called Linux for You magazine group. Another jo guy joined in called Atnu Datta, and we kind of hated each other because he was heading that magazine. And the same year, they organized an event called Linux uh, Asia. It was in 2005. And that's when I met Mark Shuttleworth. That's, I, and I, we walked around the whole building and we interviewed him. And that's when I met Jim Zemlin. And that was the time even Linux Foundation was not formed. 
uh, I met Klaus Knopper, uh, the guy from Knopix, uh, MySQL, Go, uh, you name it, and you know they were there, and we had great. I interviewed almost everybody, talked to everybody except for Linus Torvalds and RMS. And when I met these guys, I was like amazed. I was like, what? Because I came from a science background, and for us science people, patents, you know, and these things are very precious. You know, you 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 care about your copyright and patent. I'm like, what? These people are developing these technologies and giving them away for free. That makes no sense. <laughs> but you know, uh, the whole discussion that I had with Mark and all the Klaus Knopper and all those people that changed my kind of perception. Uh, and, and when I looked at it, I was like, wow. I mean, this is kind of. It gives a, a kind of purpose to your life because otherwise, as I say, you know, I was a drifter, I was a science fiction writer, but it would. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. So I actually started writing more for Linux for You magazine group, and even for EFI Times, I started doing more and more Linux stories. And uh, that's when the whole ODF thingy happened. So I did a really big story around ODF and OXML. I talked to almost everybody. And that next year was also the year when I got them their first interview on Linux Torvalds. So I talked mm -hmm. to Linus and he agreed and I interviewed them, him. And that was their first, I mean, the magazine has been for so long, but they never managed to give it. That got me even more excited. Next year, RMS was coming to India. So I offered to my editor that, hey, he's coming. I have done a lot of research on him. And uh, he's looking for somebody who can accompany him, you know, while he's in New Delhi. I would like to be that guy because I will get a story out of it. At the same time, I'll get to understand. So I spent three days with RMS while he was in India. It was crazy. It was crazy yeah. because yeah. he would not drink this lady water. So we like picked him up from the airport and you know, it was 10, 11 a.m. and he came with his girlfriend. It was 11 p.m. at night. So I had to find a store in India which does not sell this lady water. So, uh, and then it was every time we set up an interview. So we met, uh, went to meet a lot of government officials where we talked about open, by free software matters. Actually, I will be talking to uh, Richard Stallman next week. Uh, I was setting up a meeting with him, but I got flu and everything. Though that does, but anyway, so so th this hap kept happening, and, and that's when you know Linux became my kind of career. Uh, I have been writing about Linux since then. Then I got married. I moved to Germany, and Germany doesn't have any English-speaking languages, so I took kind of break. I started the Mocktober site just to keep myself updated with what's going on. Though it's so not paying, you cannot make money from AdSense unless like PewDiePie or you know whatever uh, Casey Neistat. So uh, then we moved to US, and that's why when you know in 2013 we moved to US in September. In 2014, first LinuxCon happened. And I met, you know, Jim Zellin and Libby Clark and everybody. And then I started writing the Linux Foundation. Then I started writing for CIO. And uh, then I started writing for Newstack. And then I write for Linux Pro Magazine, Admin Magazine. Uh, so, I mean, I write for a lot of, for some reason, because uh, uh, one story may have a different angle, different right. story may have a different angle, and that angle may not fit in this story. So I kind of got so addicted to this freelancing thingy that now I just do it, even if you know there is no job security there. So I have been doing all that uh, thing, but over time, um, and also I was using Linux, you know, as, uh, but over time I saw that uh, Linux desktop is not going anywhere, so I kind of moved to enterprise segment because uh, my publishers will not, you know, they are not interested in KD or Pla GNOME, you know, all those magazines. So I moved there, but you know, I do both. Like for the KD community on uh, 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 Google Plus, I started a community. Then, you know, they asked me, hey, Sopnil, can you, you know, so I just kind of donated the community to them. So I have been involved with, you know, Linux and open source uh, for a very long time. The only difference is that um, I don't sit in a in a basement and then I write about what I think. I actually go out and meet people yeah. to 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 ha be fully informed and educated. So that's my tiny journey of uh, right. Linux and open source. Yeah, I, and it, not as exciting as yours, but it, that's what it is. <laughs> I think it's it's interesting that when you talk to people about. Um, their their stories of, of how they discovered Linux and how an open source, there's always this common thread, uh, at least for a lot of the people that I've met, then the common thread being the tools that they had at their disposal weren't working and they had to find something yes. that would work. And that, yeah, the, that, was, that yeah. hmm? go, go ahead. Yeah, that was the case when uh, my my system got corrupted because of a, a virus came. It's, it was called Kama Sutra, and it was uh, corrupting all the JPEG files. So it corrupted my uh, system as well. That's when I moved to Mandriva Linux, 
and uh, then I used Debian. I hated Ubuntu back then because also it needed more RAM and my system had only 456 MB of RAM, yeah. uh, 256 MB or something like that. Uh, but then I moved to Ubuntu and then I became uh, Arch Linux user and then I became OpenSUSE user. So I have been using Linux all the while. And you're right, you know, it was more about tools. Uh, but I, I have, I, just like you, I also use Mac OS and use uh, Linux both. Windows is the only thing that I cannot tolerate because the workflow doesn't work. It's not Unix per se. It's, uh, um, I mean, on Mac OS, I get the pure Unix shell as well. I can live in terminal. So my workflow works better between Mac OS and Linux than with Windows. <clears throat> but I, I'm a strong believer of, uh, what, what is your ultimate goal? Do you want to use tool to create a work of art or do you want to use like, are you boarding a flight because you want to go somewhere? Uh, the, the thing is the, the destination versus journey thing. Yeah. <coughs> so, so my goal is that I, depends on the use case, I use a tool to get that job done. So I really right. don't care whether the tool runs on Linux or Mac, whether it's open source right. or not. Only thing that is critical to what that tool does. If right. that tool is really getting access to my, you know, it's really about like, for example, when I work on my novels, you know, then it has it it, it it always sits on my local server. It doesn't leave it because when I have a pictures of my son and kids, you know, they live on my local server. I never upload them. Right. But there are a lot of other things. Like, for example, if I'm working on a story that is going to be published tomorrow, I don't mind working on the story on Google Docs, you know. Right. If I'm editing, right. you know, uh, an image, I don't mind using uh, Adobe Photoshop. But right. Dropbox, I'll be careful with. So I, I am not of opinion that, oh, pure open source, you know, privacy, because right. I do understand what privacy and security means. I do understand. Right. So I pick and choose case by case right. basis. Well, that's, that's to, been one of yeah. my problems with, um, I, did, I did an article uh, about <coughs> predictions for 2018. And one of the predictions that I made was the rise of, of groupware, not groupware suites, but uh, office suites on Linux. And mm -hmm. that LibreOffice would improve drastically and tools like, um, a uh, soft maker would be more accepted. And I couldn't believe the flack I got because people were saying, well, soft maker's not open source. It said, but it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that it runs and it runs reliably and, and it runs on Linux and it runs well on Linux. And if you have people that you have to collaborate with and those people are working with only with uh, Microsoft Office, then your best bet might be soft maker Office. And just because it's not open source doesn't mean it's not an, a viable option. And, right. and I think, you know, and I get it. I understand the whole, the, the, the need for, for some people to have pure open source software on their, on their machines. I get that. And I respect that. But for me, that, that idea ends when open source software can't fill my needs. For example, and I, I mentioned this earlier, video editing. There is simply not a good enough tool on Linux to do video editing at the level that I need. And I tried. I used OpenShot for years and I struggled with it. And, and I, made it, I made do with it until they finally moved up to the, the I think the 2.0 version and kind of broke it all. And the old version would no longer work. And I said, at that point I said, I can no longer create the videos that I need. I've got to find another tool. And I looked at every possible video editor on Linux, even, even closed source options, and none of them would work because, because the, 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 the video drivers, the communication between the, the software level and the hardware level on Linux with regards to video editing is just painfully bad. So, I finally, and, and this was kind of also precipitated by the fact that I was, I got hired to do a, another uh, job for a company that the software that they needed, they, they needed a plug-in for, uh, I think it's called on24.com, and the on24.com did not have a plug-in for Linux or uh, Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. And I would not use Windows because every time I ever get near Windows, I feel like it's going to crash on me. So yeah. I said, okay, fine, I'll buy a Mac. So actually, I talked to you about this, and, and you kind of helped me kind of win me over to buying a Mac. So I bought the Mac, and 
Next thing I know, I'm like, well, let's see what the video editor's like. So I downloaded uh, Final Cut Pro Trial, and I was like, oh my gosh, wow. That's what video <laughs> editing is supposed tech, to be yeah. like. And and I know that there are people that prefer other other solutions, but, and, and, and I know that a lot of people uh, were kind of upset about Final Cut Pro, the latest version, because it was so different, but because I hadn't tried any of the Final Cut Pros before, this was just yeah, like, yeah. it was magic <clears throat> to me. It, and, and, exactly. it, and it made video editing so easy. I know. I used to be, uh, I have always been a KDE Plasma user, and I used to be KDE and Live user. I wrote a oh, lot yeah. of stories about it. But, 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 no, it doesn't work in the workflow. You have gave so many examples for me. When I go to these events, I shoot in 4K, and I have multiple cameras set up. I have to sync audio from five different devices. Uh, and I have bought a lot of plugins to get, I mean, you are creating a piece of art, right? You don't, yeah. like you are telling G.R.R. Martin that I don't care about whether Cersei gets the throne or, or, or you know, right. uh, Daenerys get the throne. Just use LibreOffice to write the story. That's the only thing I care about, that you should use right. either G.Edit or LibreOffice. No. Right. Artists use the tool that they need for right. their job. At the right. same time, as you also mentioned, for a lot of people, it may be the tool that is more important than the file and product. Like for example, I'm a lot into RC cars. I don't drive those. I don't drive those cars that much as much as I repair and customize them. Right. <coughs> so, like I have a 3D printer and I just pr printed this sawtooth from uh, from you know uh, what do you call it uh, Zero Dawn Horizon. So, nice. uh, but most of the time I spent. You know, I use printer. You know, it, it's it, it, tool is more important than the outcome. You know. Yeah, so it's yeah. not like I'm. I just make them and I put them in the corner and decorate them. So you 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 are right that you know for a lot of people it really matters that you know they have pure open source. I'm not that person. You are yeah. not that person. We right. need the right tools. But at the same time, we are also kind of the way I look at it is that I know a lot of people in the open source world they themselves don't use the platform, but they have done much more to promote open source than those people who live in terminal. Right. So, right. so my job is not to run Linux on my system. My job is to be fully educated, fully informed, and then talk about it. Right. right. Just because Elon Musk is, is you know, uh, 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 or uh, uh, just because you are a rocket scientist, that doesn't mean you should not drive a car. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. So that and, and brings I, me to, yeah, please go ahead. I, re I remember when, um, after I bought that, that MacBook, um, I was so enamored by it that for a brief moment, I thought, well, maybe my next computer, because my, my main computer is a System76 Leopard Extreme, which is an absolutely amazing piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah. at, when I bought that MacBook, I thought, well, maybe I should go ahead and go full in and get an uh, uh, iMac. And my wife was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you have you have hung your hat on Linux for so long. You can't you can't use do that. You can't do that. And I thought, well, I could use, you know, I could use parallels and still run Linux. But then I thought, yeah, yeah she's kind of right. Um and but but even so, I'm so glad that I have that MacBook because it here's here's a great example of of kind of what we're talking about. A while ago, a few years ago, uh I was trying to find maybe a new tool to write my books because I I'm an also I'm also an author and I write mm -hmm. all sorts of all sorts of uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for a possible new tool to write my fiction with. This was before I started writing my first drafts in Google Docs. And someone and I was doing my searches for them and someone actually said, "Well, why don't you just write your books in 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 DocBook or in Markup? Do use it in Markup language?" I was like, "Are you kidding me? This is a sixty or seventy thousand word book. I'm right. not going to take the extra time." to write it in markup language? Do you realize that, that I would be, I would get one book done a year at that, at the most. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this is a, this is a full length book we're talking about. This isn't a, this isn't a, a, a term paper. Right. And, and so the, to the, the very idea of writing an actual book from the command line is insane. And I know people mm -hmm. have done it, and, and I remember a very long time ago, way back when I first started my writing career, um, I thought it would be really cool to, to write a story from the command line. And I tried it, and I think I got a half a chapter into it, and I was like, no, this is stupid. I can't do right. this. Mm -hmm. My energy needs to be focused on creating this world and these characters and this dialogue, not on programming the words to get from the terminal to a file. Right. 
people have already done that. It's called LibreOffice. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And when, when, when I am writing, I mean, I also write fiction, though <coughs> I'm not as proficient as you are. I'm writing, uh, you have, I think, just finished uh, uh, a novel called Potus. We'll talk Potus, about yeah. that also. Uh, so when, when I write my novel, uh, or when I'm working on my fiction, uh, for, for text stories, I don't care. I, I use Ulysses on Mac. I use Gedit on uh, Linux. I use Sublime Text, which is cross-platform on both. Right. Then, then uh, 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 I want the font rendering to be perfect. When yeah. I ital italicize something, when I make something bold, you know, when I put something in quotes, yeah, I I I I, I want the impression that I'm actually hearing my character talk. Yeah. yeah. So uh, because I am in a totally different world at that moment, so I don't want uh, bad font rendering or whatever it is come in my way. So I mostly write. My, I, I'm, and I'm very particular about font rendering and how it looks. So I mostly do my, my fiction work either in Microsoft Word, I pay $99 to them, or Pages. Because the font rendering, no offenses, LibreOffice yeah. doesn't have that good. It's great. No, you're right. Yeah, yeah. You're right. And, uh, and as you mentioned in your article earlier that, you know, it cannot even deal with a huge uh, piece yeah. of work. Yeah. Uh, so, so that brings us uh, to another interesting point. Uh, uh, that is that, why are we doing this? Oh, before we talk about that, what, what, what is POTUS all about? <laughs> POTUS is, um, okay, I had, I wrote this other book called Punk Ass Punk, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a story about a punk band that is hired by the NSA to take down a drug lord. And I wrote that a year and a half ago or so. And after, after 2016 happened, I realized that, that I, the, there was something building up inside of me. And I, I won't get in too deep into it, but I needed, desperately needed a release. I needed catharsis from what I was feeling from this, this landscape of, of, of whatever you want to call it, whatever mm -hmm. you, you can call it a nightmare or whatever. But there was all these feelings welling up inside of me. And I knew that I needed to vent all of that out Otherwise, I was going to absolutely lose my mind. So I came up with this idea for a book. And the idea was, what if I put somebody in a race for president against an incumbent president that's very much like the one we have now? And if I put somebody that's completely opposite of a politician in a way that the president we have now could not have fathomed. And instantly I thought, what about the lead singer from my punk band? Mm -hmm. What if he ran for president? But even better, <clears throat> what if he was asked to run for president by an official legal group? I won't get into too many details, but... Yeah, don't give away the story. So just to... I, 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 I realized that that's exact, that was the book that I had to write at that time because I'm very much about writing whatever the universe tells me to write. I don't... Mm -hmm. I, don't I keep an editorial calendar for my tech stuff, but I don't keep an editorial calendar for my books because the universe is going to tell me what to write when it's time for me to write it. So mm -hmm. I started writing this book, and it was so cathartic for me. I could say so many things... From, I could say it from a narrator's level. I could say it from a character's point of view. That's true. And, and I, I, I drew from kind of the, some of the things that I posted socially about the president and how he, his, his speech patterns. And so I drew the character of the incumbent president from that. And it's, it's going to be a series, I hope. And, and what I'm going to do now, it's in the hand of beta readers now. And the first beta reader's already gotten back to me, and she absolutely loved it. But, um, and my fear was that it was, it really was just a book about me just lambasting and bashing on the president instead of a story. And fortunately, I actually wrote a story. <laughs> but yeah. um, as soon as I get it back from beta readers and I send it off to my editor, then I'm going to start, I'm going to start trying to find an agent for it. Because I, mm -hmm. I, um, I, I work with one small publisher, and but at, for one series and all my other stuff, I I, it's, I do I indie publish it. Uh, but I, I've reached the point. I've written almost forty books now, and I've reached the point where it's time for me to go try to go back to the 
big six publishers and find yes. an agent and go that route. And I think that this book is that book that I need to use for that because it's very timely. And I think I think because it was so cathartic for me, I think it would be very cathartic for anybody that is feeling right. this angst right now. And so, and I to write like I said to write it. I I use all I use Google Docs to write all of my first drafts, and then um, I send it off to my editor, and she uses Microsoft Word, and we go back and forth. When I get it back, I use Pages, Apple Pages. Mm -hmm. And then once I get it, when it's, it's finalized, then I import it or I open it with LibreOffice and I format it with LibreOffice. And then I save it as an HTML document. And then I use Calibra to uh, convert it from HTML to either EPUB or Mobi. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of the tools I use are open source. Right. But right. Just, just a couple of them aren't. And that, that's, so, that's, yeah. my, that's my workflow for all of my books. Right, right. Yeah, that's excellent workflow. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, as you said, you know, most of your workload is uh, runs on open source. And I think that's the direction we are moving towards uh, because I cover enterprise world and there uh, from Microsoft to Facebook, people don't know, but Facebook is actually the biggest open source company in the world. They don't sell any product, but everything runs on Linux and they are one of the biggest right. contributors to most of the projects. You know, they have open source everything. Even they have open source their whole stack, you know, that runs, you know, it's called open compute. If you yeah. go to any Linux and open source event, you'll see a Facebook booth and they have the whole stack of servers and yeah. companies like Google, everybody is contributing on those, you know, actual hardware. So uh, people don't know, but, you know, there is a lot of open source happening. It's just the consumer space, which is a tricky market. But I think right. that that needs to change. And but the problem is that it's not changing because the, the, the conversations that we are having in the in the either desktop Linux space or consumer space, are the wrong conversations. Yes, yesterday I was watching a video on YouTube about uh, Ubuntu is collecting data, and when I looked at the video, I I, I, I thought of Alex Jones, you know. It, that's the yeah. kind of level of discussion that is going on. It's fear-mongering, it's treating yeah. technology as religion, that if you're a Muslim, you cannot be a Christian. I mean, that's happened only in religion, right? You're a, right. You cannot be a Christian and Muslim. Right. But for technology, I love technology, I don't care. Yeah. As long as I get the freedom to choose the right tools for my job. Exactly. It could be Linux, it could be Mac OS, Windows, I'm not very sure. But it, that's why I have Samsung Galaxy Note, which runs on Android, I have Nexus, uh, uh, I have Pixel, I have iPhone uh, yeah. X. Everything I want to enjoy everything. Why should sure. we be deprived? So, so, so the conversation that I wanted to have is that our love for technology. I mean, right now, as you intro in, in the beginning, that we are kind of surrounded by technology just to record this video. Uh, but how, 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 how to kind of bring the open source community into the mainstream, and how to bring the mainstream, you know, user base to the open source world. That's sure. the kind of thing that I uh, I am more leaning towards. And right. so, so from your perspective, what is your idea about what we are trying to do here at in the YouTube? Well, it's, it's very similar to what, what, what you discussed. There's this, there's this strange thing that happens with technology. We have the open source zealots that don't care about the end users. And then we have the end users that don't care about the developers. And there's this big chasm between them. And in reality, if the open source zealots didn't have end users to use their products, they wouldn't be necessary. And if the end users didn't have the open source zealots creating the products, they wouldn't be able to do anything. And so I, and I have spent years trying to bridge that gap to try to, sh to try to look at the developers and say, look, you have one job, and that job is to create a product that the end users can use. And end users, you have a job to use the product. And there doesn't need to be this huge rift between you. Developers shouldn't be developing for developers. They should be developing for users. Because if they don't, then, they're, then they're, the scope of their audience is going to continue to shrink. And there was a brief period, or there was a period, long period in time with open source where that was happening, where developers were only developing for developers. Yeah. You, had, you had the GNOME developers who only listened to what other developers asked or said. 
They never really cared about what the end user said. Same thing with all of the other platforms. And, and, I, and I think that, and, and I'm, my, my perspective may be a little bit skewed, but I think at one point in time, it, it was Ubuntu that finally said, oh, maybe we need to listen to the end users. Now, yeah. of course, there have been periods where Ubuntu said, yeah, we don't need to listen to the end users. But the truth of the matter is, is you do. So I, my goal, I think, is to try to help people understand that we are an ecosystem, a mm -hmm. very delicately balanced ecosystem, wherein each side of the coin depends upon the other. And hopefully, with dialogue and, and reason and understanding, those two sides can open their eyes and say, oh, okay, I do need to listen to the other side. Otherwise, I may as well just be speaking to a wall or I may as well just be developing for myself. <laughs> and that's not going to do any good. If you keep preaching to the choir, the choir is never going to get any bigger. And for the longest right. time, that's what open source developers did. They preach to the choir. Well, the choir's already been sold on your product. You need to sell the product to the people outside. It's been more than 27 years now. Yeah. Linux was created like more than 27 years and it's been 27 yeah. years and we are still under 1% or 2% market share. Yeah. And, it, 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 and, and, and uh, uh, I, I think you have touched upon the, the core point that, uh, so, so going forward uh, for the next episode of this show we have to actually find a name of the show also it depends on how it is received so i think our readers and viewers can share their opinion what should we call it jack swap or something <laughs> uh, so 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 going forward what kind of uh, i i don't like the word content because it's uh, what, what kind of you know discussion uh, people can expect in this show well i think that we're going we'll probably talk a lot about about the, the needs of the end user and the needs of the developer, about desktops, about the right tools to use and, and the wrong tools to use. I, th I think that um, probably we'll not talk about market share mm -hmm. because yes. I, don't, I think market share is, is a word that really has only, only has value to people who crunch numbers. Mm -hmm. And even then, I think it's, there's so many false flags involved with market share that who I mean really and I've always felt this way it's like you know what I, what I was thinking of, I'm sorry I don't want to interrupt you but no, I ahead. think we can also talk about market share in a way that does it really matter yeah exactly exactly uh, and exactly. second point is that I do hear I was watching another uh, Alec Jones C like <laughs> YouTube uh, video <laughs> that like, oh this is the problem that I face when I go and search Linux on YouTube it's really hard to find mature content out there. Right, right. right. So, so this is, that's what I want to change. And, and, and so people were like, oh, Linux has marketing problem. No, it does not. It has platform problem. People yeah. don't use operating system. People use applications to get work done. Right, right? right. If marketing was a problem, uh, sorry, marketing was the challenge, Microsoft would be dominating the, the Xbox world. Microsoft would be dominating the mobile world. They have all the money in the world, but no. They, they failed, you know, so it's not a marketing. So we, I think we can discuss those topics as well because that can be of interest. Uh, yeah. And uh, as you said, it's mostly, I think the, the impression that I get is mostly that it will be, you know, kind of uh, a bridge, you know, what developers want and what users want and what is like, because you and I are users. Yeah. You know, yeah. we don't sit on computer to fix, oh, the audio is not working. Like, because I've seen a lot of YouTube videos where people spend half of their video in just fixing the audio. <laughs> yeah. on Linux systems. Yeah. So, so I think uh, those are the things. And we can decide on the next story, what should be the next story. And I think uh, we can right. see uh, where we go. Well, what just a really quick on what you just touched on was, I think that Chrome OS proved that platform doesn't matter. Right. Because it's a web browser. It's a, it's right. a glorified web browser. And how many people get their work done on Chrome OS? A lot, yes. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, Linux does have a. I, I think Linux has two problems. I think they have a platform problem and a marketing problem. But I, th I think the marketing problem would be solved by solving the platform problem. 
Yeah, because if, if, if you look at the marketing problem, I, I, I'm giving you my own experience is that I have never seen a Chromebook in, in any store that I went to. They don't sell here in the DC. I have never seen any Chromebook. But really? Th 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 yeah, I, I mean, I have never, I mean, they, they, all they have is either Windows or, or, uh, or, uh, or what you call it. Mac. Uh, Mac OSs, but nothing uh, running Chrome OS. At the same time, you don't see pixels also on, on you know, stores, but they have the market. It's not about, it's, it's not about uh, putting the device in the store. It's right. more about that one person uses the device and that person finds it actually works. Yeah. It solves the platform problem. That, that person can get the work done. That person does you know, word of my mouth, and, but this person is not a techie. There's a big difference. Right. When techies right. tell other people, it never works. Right. My right. wife doesn't listen to me, you know. 80% right. of her shopping come her, from her friends. And when her friends talk to me as a techie, they do know that, oh, it's Sopnil, you know. So he's, right. tech. but they will buy, you know, uh, no matter how much I say, they will buy whatever their friends buy. So, so it's, uh, it, I, I still think it's more of a platform, pro because we can talk about the marketing, you know, in the next episode. Sure, sure, sure. You know, if that is a problem and how, how other platform has succeeded, you know. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, Look at Chrome, you know, Microsoft controlled Windows Word, but Chrome became dominant, you know. Google did not have anything to put in the right. Microsoft Word to promote Chrome, you know, but Chrome, right. why? Because it worked, the platform it problem. Works, exactly. So yeah, I think we can have a different perspective on different topics, but I, from personal, my, my personal point of view, I think I am very much, you know, kind of interested and excited, you know, about talking, I've been following your writing for so long, both in fiction and non-fiction domain so i'm really excited you know to be to be to be to be working with you on this show oh, yeah. where we talk about linux and open source and and kind of have some great conversation there so yeah, I, th I hope I think the this, readers will like it too i do too, i agree and i i think that and, and i think one of the things that you you mentioned a number of times to me personally and and in here is that finding a, a mature conversation about open source has become rare and I think that that's one thing that we, we can offer is, is a mature conversation. We may not agree on everything, no. but, but we can maturely discuss it and, right. and, and show the people out there, be they developers or users, that there is an alternative and a mature alternative and that, that the idea of finding the right tool to get the job done in the most efficient and reliable way you can is the single most important thing you can do with technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's not a it's like a, it's not about being a zealot. I right. I have been I have been the Linux zealot for a while. I have for been a, too. A long yeah. time. I know. And and for for a while, I mean, I fought tooth and nail in business and in personal life to say I lost a lot I'm, of friends. Yeah, I lost oh, a lot uh, of yeah, friends because they yeah. were Mac users, and I would call them names, and you know, yeah. and yeah. It, it ended there. And now it's just it's all about I just have to get my work done. Exactly. So I think I think we should just think about uh, the gist of this is that instead of putting technology in center and put people around it, let's put people in center. Exactly. Why we do anything? Right. Why we do? Why we watch Game of Thrones? Why we read your book? Why right. we watch? You know, uh, uh, right. the alternate. You know, Carbon. Or, uh, what is it called? What's that? The new show, Alternate Carbon. Oh, Altered Carbon. Altered yeah. Carbon whatever whatever reason you watch that you know so same with the computers yeah you you buy it for a per so so i think yeah with, you're right you know more mature conversion more realistic conversion not you know where yeah. you you just come up, oh we should do yeah. for the sake of doing it yeah. as a zealots no so and you're right uh, we, we have to put people first you have to put rest. people in the center of the discussion and once you do that i think problems will solve themselves I, all the problems will be solved if we put people in the center, no matter whether it's politics or it's social or exactly. technological. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay, then uh, you, you, as a, you, you are a senior writer than me, so you can wrap it up and then we'll look forward to the next episode. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for listening and watching me and Swapna in this uh, as to be yet un unnamed video cast. We will hopefully, by the next time we do this, we will have a name for this. If you have a suggestion for a name, please leave it in the comments. Be nice. Or not. We can ignore those not nice comments if we want. But seriously, thank you 
for tuning into us. We appreciate it. Uh, open source community appreciates it. We appreciate you. We appreciate the open source community. Come back next time. We'll have a, we'll have another specific topic to talk about and we will keep it mature and we will keep it fun.